So good evening everybody, my name is Maeve O'Connell and I am the Alumni Relations Manager for the College of Science. I'm delighted to welcome you to this evening's UCD In Conversation webinar, Rising Energy Costs and Blackouts, Our Data Centres to Blame. Our topic is very timely with COP26 underway in Glasgow and as we move into the colder, darker months of winter. This evening's episode is part of our UCD In Conversation series. Through this series, we welcome our alumni community and friends from around the world to listen to fellow alumni and UCD academics and guests as they share their stories and ideas. The series also reflects UCD's rising to the future strategy and its four strategic themes, creating a, glo a sustainable global society, transforming through digital technology, building a healthy world and empowering humanity. And I'm delighted now to welcome our expert panelists for this evening. Associate Professor Damian Dalton from the UCD School of Computer Science is our moderator, and he'll be joined by Professor Andrew Keane, Director of the UCD Energy Institute and the SFI Energy Systems Integration Partnership Programme, and Gary Connolly, founder of Host in Ireland. Host in Ireland is a strategic global initiative created to increase awareness of the benefits of hosting digital assets in Ireland. This evening's format will be a roughly 45 minute conversation between our panelists, followed by a short Q&A session with questions from our audience. And we'll aim to wrap up at about 8 p.m. We'll share any links and websites mentioned during tonight's In Conversation in the chat channel. So feel free to submit your questions throughout the conversation using the Q&A function, and Damien will get to as many of these as he can. So with all of that said, it's my pleasure now to hand you over to our moderator, Damien, to kick off this evening's In Conversation. Okay, good evening everyone to all the alumni and guests here in Dublin and around the world. So wherever you are, good evening, good morning, or good afternoon. Um, this evening's conversation is looking at the economic and social environmental impact of data centres in Ireland. And it's a conversation that is not uh, unique to Ireland. All industrialised countries with a large IT infrastructure are having these discussions. And it's important that we address these issues because in the longer term, we want to build a sustainable world. It's perhaps pertinent to guide and direct tonight's discussion with the within the context of the events, talks and Decisions that are happening in Glasgow at the COP26, uh, we all, I think, at this stage realise that we need to change our attitudes, we need to have a different uh, set of norms for society and our economies. And in essence, we need a sustainable world where the opportunities of future generations are not going to be compromised by the decisions we take today. So to start tonight's conversation, um, I'll uh, introduce or talk to, to Gary first and say, data, cloud, data centres, 20 years ago, these words didn't really exist. Um, maybe if you were in sort of a specialist or expert in computer science, you would have heard these terms. But to the ordinary individual, data centers didn't mean anything. So why, why data centers? Why data? Why Ireland? Thank you so much, um, Damien. Thank you to the alumni for inviting me. I actually am a, the only college I went to was Ratmines College of Commerce. So thank you so much for inviting me into this uh, forum. But uh, you're absolutely right, and I thank you for asking the initial question that we give some context to what data is. Um, because as, as was said already, COP26 is on at the moment, and one of the things that's coming out very strongly from the COP26 is that we need some form of a sustainable revolution. And I use the word very uh, with great strength because the three aspects that I'm learning as I listen is that what will constitute a sustainable revolution is three things. We need to believe the science. That's the first thing. We need to understand the science. We need to change human behavior, all aspects of human behavior from policy through to individuals. But the third thing that probably is, is uh, very much coming out, and even David Attenborough spoke about it yesterday, is we need to use the technologies that are available to us to help us to use the products and services and most of those are called smart technologies. I read the papers, everybody looks at things and they see smart cities, improving energy efficiency and air quality, smart cars, smart meters, to be able to read and sell on and sell off the grid and, and all the stuff that I'm sure uh, will be discussed today. 
it's only smart for one reason. And it's driven by one thing to make it smart, and that's data. Data is the equivalent today in what they classify as the fourth industrial revolution as what steam was in the first one. So when you consider, and I, I get uh, asked it all the time, why do we need to have so many cats running up curtains stored in data centers? Actually, social media is a very small part of the overall footprint. Most of the products and services are actually what we use in science. You know, we, we had announced yesterday that the COVID vaccine took 10, 10 months to develop. Only 10 years ago, it would have taken 12 years. Why? Because the data in the centers and the compute power is such that we can use it. We then get to Ireland. And actually, uh, we're second largest data cluster in Europe right now. The largest, I guess, technically in Europe, because Britain is no longer in the EU 27, but by size, let's call it the geographic uh, Europe. And actually, it's a demotion, because guess what? We were first in 2000. Interesting you mentioned 2000. For many people listening here, you remember the dot-com bubble. You probably remember Ireland being the center of the universe for localization. You know, we have Microsoft, you have Oracle, you'd SAP, you'd Bon, you'd all these companies printing out floppy disks and CD-ROMs. It was very tangible. But with the dot-com bubble, that all changed. The thing called the internet was invented. Microsoft, Oracle, whoever else was working here. We were the largest exporter in the world of software. Three billion quid was going out of Ireland. We had to stay in that space. We needed to move it to centers. Floppy disks are the evolution or sorry, data centers are just the evolution of, of floppy disks. So when people talk about Ireland and we, we've emerged as this superpower in data, guess what? We always were. It was just a different medium. I won't suggest to you, Damien, that you remember uh, punch cards, but that's when Ireland got into this gig, when, when punch cards were around, right? And IBM that's were right. here in 56 and that. So now we arrive at 2021, and we are the, the largest export from Ireland. And data in the centers is just an extension of our FDI story. That's all it is. We are, you know, it's 140, 150 billion quid every year is the ICT related services, you know, com compared to some of the other industries, the legacy industries that are maybe eight. So that's just some context for you. Uh, uh, you know, there are challenges of success. Okay, and we're talking about that. A valid point, Gary. Yeah, I can see. Like, we I think we we all use you know Netflix. We have in this meeting this evening, the Zoom meeting is is by virtue of data centers here or elsewhere around the world. So For sure, it's undoubted that there are many benefits that data centers bring to society and economy. But th there have been a lot of concerns now, just about the price we have to pay in terms of the energy or carbon footprint of data centers. Data centers here in Ireland. I mean, looking at AirGrid and uh, the Commission for Regulation of Utilities, they just in June of this year said that they had uh, concerns about rolling blackouts if action is not taken on data center growth. Now, I don't think they're suggesting that we should eliminate or, you know, um, you know um, remove data centers from our economy. But it, it, there are concerns that are being raised by you know, reputable bodies about this, the uh, footprint. When I put it in context. The growth over the last four years in data centers has meant about 140, is equivalent to 140,000 um, 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 home households coming onto the grid every year. Now that's equivalent to the size, I don't know, of about Waterford coming onto the grid every year. I mean, that's a big, a big burden on the national grid and that possibly is going to have repercussions down the line, particularly if we want to be more green and there is a limited capacity in the grid. How do you how do you take that uh, okay. you know, that criticism? Well, as I said, it's, there's, there's challenges associated with success, mm. always. Okay, mm. and yes, we have this challenge where we cannot get enough green electrons mm. feeding our society. Okay, mm. and I don't want to take away from the professor, but but. One of the things that was really encouraging last week, and I think there's the, the new climate action plan today has backed that up, mm -hmm. is that when the EPA last week published the numbers for 2020, it was very clear, despite and in spite of the growth of electricity, 
the only sector that performed in line with the EU targets was electricity. Mm -hmm. Ireland's electricity is 43% in 2020 from renewable sources annualized. It represents 15% of our overall carbon, methane, et cetera, carbon emissions and greenhouse gases, 15%, okay? Now there are other asset classes in there that are 37%. There are other classes there that are 25%, but it has been identified that the actual easiest sector to decarbonize is electricity. Why? Because you don't have consumer changing behavior. So we can change the grid. And I, I'm really interested in what the professor will say. But when we look at the generating cap capacity of this little island in, on and around Ireland, we have generating capacity. And I know we're we're talking in electricity here of 64 to 70 gigawatts. OK. We're using five today. Well, well, maybe we'll, what we can bring Andrew into the conversation here. Andrew, um, are we facing a crisis on the national grid? I mean, are we going to sometime in the future, and maybe sooner rather than later, be a situation where we are going to have to consider blackouts? It'll be a case of do we keep the data centers running or do we switch them off so we can have tonight's dinner or have our breakfast tomorrow morning? Where are we in, in terms of the national grid and the capacity to absorb the demand of the data center? And also in view of what Michael Martin announced just recently, you know, in the COP26, we're looking at electrification of our transport system. Mm. And with all those, you know, future demands, all those, um, you know, projects coming down down the line, are we going to be in a position where we can sort of fulfill them? Can we fulfill our promises that we're making to COP26? Thanks, Damien, and thanks for having me join the conversation. Um, so I, I, I don't think the situation is maybe quite as, as stark as, as your, your question poses to me there. Um, I mean, the amber alerts that we've seen on the system are, are real. So I mean, that's, that's not without note and is of some concern. But, you know, for me, it's a question of choices here. Um, if we're in favour of industrial development and everything that data centres bring, and I think Gary's quite right to say that it's part of the FDI picture and story, well, then we need to also then make the choice to invest in the grid, and the grid needs investment, uh, and we need to invest in generation capacity. So, you know, we have time now to take steps to avoid any, you know, unwelcome situations in, in the coming years, and I think it's really important that we do that. Investment in gas plants is part of that, but of course, investment in renewables an ongoing expanded investment in renewable energy is also absolutely part of that. Also part of that is the grid, the wires, the cables and so on. So as much as you see a wind farm, you need to invest in the you know, accompanying infrastructure. And that's been a tricky point for us, not just in Ireland, but in, in the Western world in terms of getting consent to do that. And, and perhaps rightly so, but we need to kind of accept what kind of society do we want? Do we want to continue on this path of industrial development? If so, there's a range of investments that are needed and they should avoid any need for, for blackouts. There's always a possibility of a power cut or maybe a, a blackout. No system is 100% reliable. So anyone who says they can give you a cast, guarant cast iron guarantee of no blackouts, you know, I wouldn't trust them necessarily, but it's a low probability event. The longer we spend in these amber alert periods, the probability goes up for sure, but it still remains really low probability. And the grid operator air grid have a number of, let's say levers you can say, to operate to avoid any uncontrolled kind of situation developing on the grid up to and including of course you know uh, asking large industrial users and i think including data centers you know to you know modulate their demand in real time that's always been part of how the grid has been managed and in yeah. fact sorry i'll stop there maybe to let you in but because no, you know, so, there's, there's really two issues I, th I think when it comes to the, the supply one is the capacity to supply just you know energy electricity and then the other issue is how green is that energy that yeah. we're, we're using and there's sort of some ways two separate questions and um, where are we going to get all this extra green energy that, that you know if we're going to have 70 percent of our electricity by 2030 is going to be green where's that green going to come from well, it's, it's going to come in this country mainly from wind energy in Ireland. Uh, we've had a lot of onshore. Gary's quite right to point out the fact that, you know, 43% of our electricity came from wind. So of all the targets towards 2020, renewable electricity is the one we hit 
transport mm. and heat nowhere close agriculture we have, haven't done enough on that yet electricity is a massive success story for the country in terms of the integration of renewables uh, we don't always celebrate our successes and the key point here is we're an island on the western edge of europe you know weakly interconnected into britain no interconnection into the european union any longer so the technical challenges are, are even higher than the rest of the world so it's a massive success story that we've, we've done what we can do Mm -hmm. And I would advocate strongly that we should continue on that path. It, offshore wind in the Irish Sea in the coming years. And Gary mentions, I think, 60 gigawatts. In the future, we have, you know, deep waters in our, in, within our island on, the, on our coastline. So floating offshore wind has a massive potential. Mm -hmm. To supply energy far in excess of anything that this island would ever need. So it's yeah. an energy export possibility. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, and I'm a technology optimist just, just in general, I suppose, just to say that. So I, I think there's a, a big opportunity for us. Um, but it's a, wo a wonderful point you make, Andrew. Sorry, sorry uh, Dave. Right. Yeah, go ahead, wonderful. Because what it leads us into, and this is a great opportunity to dispel some of the hyper myths, you know, I mean, what gets into the narrative is blackouts, okay? Mm. And as people, on that's a really emotive thing, isn't it? That to me is gone, bringing me back. Uh, Andrew doesn't remember, he's too young, but the 70s, man. You know, um, but ultimately what it means is it's a great thing to throw out there. But if you understand the grid, which I don't to the level that maybe the professor does, is there is a pecking order. And the last people usually to get disconnected are, um, you know, the, the hospitals and people's houses. But large energy users sign a contract known that should it develop, they will be curtailed. Mm -hmm. They will be asked to curtail. And in its case of a data center asset, I just want to reinforce to people, it's a mission critical 24 seven piece of asset. They have on site generation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They have yeah. on site generation. So that brings, yeah. Oh, I can just bring, sorry, cut you across, uh, Gary, just on that, the on site. This is just two aspects to it. One, is, as Andrew has highlighted, that we're going to use wind. You know, there's going to be wind turbines going to be onshore and offshore. Now, unfortunately, from a data center perspective, most of those data centers are on the East Coast, they're in Dublin. Uh, in wind generation is going to be predominantly on the Atlantic coast of Ireland. And according to the Irish Academy of Engineering, uh, just in August, they said that because of that disparity, that the generation is not located where it's being consumed, there'll be a necessity to have 9 billion invested in the infrastructure, in the grid, to basically distribute the wind power uh, generation. Is, well, is that correct, Andrew? I mean, is that a correct analysis? Well, I, don't know if, I don't know if that, I haven't read that Academy report or 9 billion, but that, my point is absolutely where you, to connect to get the energy from where it needs, from where it's sourced, so in this case, mm. the seas, to the grid, to the demand, it's going to require that. But when I, when I don't view that as necessarily a bad thing. I kind of, Eddie O'Connor, who many people will be familiar with, has been talking about the supergrid for many, many years. And I really think the time of the supergrid is now at hand because the story, if you look at a map of Europe, a lot of landlocked countries, they don't have offshore wind resource. So mm. other parts will have solar. So the future is solar PV and wind. Now we need long-term so really the distribution is something that part of that but you know it's energy transmission electricity as an energy vector as a way of transmitting energy is pretty efficient as it goes actually so, so this is know. something that the government would have to do regardless of data centers we need infrastructure investment and i don't i don't see it as be that i don't see that that need for that investment being directly linked to data center particularly you know yeah, i, I think for, the data centers well, Damien, Damien, sorry, Damien, sorry gary Damien, could we also just, uh, I'm sorry to, to cut across, no, you, but actually that. this decade's real heavy lifting for renewable energy is on the East Coast. It's in the yeah, Irish yeah. and on top of the Celtic Sea. Yeah. Deep water is a new technology, you know, going around the bottom and around. We have so much of it, but the original, even with the today's uh, Climate Action Plan, I think they've increased the ambition to five gig minimum from three and a half. But I think the capacity in there is eight to 10 in the, in, in the Irish and the, the, so as the professor rightly says, this is incredible opportunity for Ireland who never had really an awful lot of natural resources. We missed the previous resources of gold and diamonds and others. We have such an excess. And 
it's really interesting to see how exciting recently people were getting to the point uh, that, that Andrew was saying about we're going to become the Saudi Arabia to win that, you know, why would we get so excited about exporting electrons, which is a raw material, a raw material, when we have the potential to turn that into a digital product and export the digital product as an end product and monetize it for Ireland? Why would we export? So, you know, it's maybe not what people want to hear today, but within a decade, we will be at a situation where people will realize that we have eight times more ca generating capacity in on and around our shores than we can ever use and then we have a choice right <laughs> but also and, and, and the final point i make there's a statistic that's regularly distributed and it's by air grid and rightly so that by 2030 25 percent of the electricity in ireland will be consumed by data centers that's only 25 percent of the generated capacity we still have another 50 gigawatts. So that so if we take the data center number, I could easily say, well, actually, yes, that's 25% of the electricity on the grid, but it's only 4% of our potential generated capacity, which Eddie O'Connor and others want to build super nodes around Ireland and export somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So it's a raw material. I'd be really interested in Andrew's view on how we can get people to realize that this is the equivalent of gold or diamonds or oil in a different time. Yeah. It's a raw material. But so, on that concern that people have for green, just last November, the um, Irish government had to pay 50 million to Denmark and Estonia for a shortfall in the output of the green power. I mean, is that not an indication that we do have some difficulties about just the amount of green energy that we we we're, we have in our in it's, our grid. We're not at, at this point in time without any expansion. We're already paying tariffs or or fines for not fulfilling our obligations in terms of green powering our grid. No, absolutely. But if you look at our energy, if you look at energy usage, you you know most of us there's a, bit, a good chunk of electricity, heat, and transport are the other two more dominant you know segments of energy usage. And we've not made enough progress uh, as a nation in, in decarbonizing heat and transport. Now, the plan of the government from 2019 and indeed restated just today in the Climate Action Plan, in Ireland's Climate Action Plan, is shift a chunk of heat and transport into electricity because we know that we have a chance and a way forward to decarbonize electricity. So the fines are, we're missing other targets, but again, the only target we really hit out of all the sectors was, was the electricity one. So, and just looking at the Climate Action Plan today, I mean, it's 62 to 81 percent emissions reduction by 2030. So if you look at the different sectors, you know, the government have put their their chips on electricity being the sector that can actually deliver decarbonisation. And on, the more on such a of crucial the demand, point, if I may ahead, sorry, sir. Andrew, on such a crucial point that you highlight there, Andrew, that electrification of transport and a lot of our, our own activities and our targets that we set, is the government policy, is the government strategy there now to fulfill that? Or is it just an abstract you know, um, <laughs> wish at this point in time? Where are we in terms of reality here in Ireland? Are we going to be a situation where we uh, have these promises, but in five years time, we're looking at a situation where it hasn't materialized? Well, that's 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 the concern on a couple of fronts, I guess. So, um, and and so this the recent talk about a tightness or shortage on the grid or the capacity being stretched, right? That you know that's that's not that's doing little to build public confidence and, and having public confidence in electricity as the energy vector of the future is vital. So you know, and a part of these targets is a million electric vehicles. Now that means. The public of Ireland buying an electric vehicle and trusting that there's going to be a grid to charge. Now I think there will. Investing in heat pumps to replace their oil boiler or their open fire. So uh, that's that's what I see as one of the big risks to what's going on at the moment is that it might just detract from confidence. And I've already had, I'm sure everyone has anecdotal conversation. People are going to go, oh well, it's going to be black as I'm not going to buy an electric car. Or what? And you know, I don't. That's if you're just reading the papers, it's not unreasonable that people would draw that that conclusion. So um. I think the targets are right, but I think there's going to be significant, it's going to be challenging 
Uh, man, it's going to be challenging for all the various stakeholders, for AirGrid, for ESB, for the various sectors, you know. And, and data centers would need to play their part in that. But I, I suspect you're going to, Gary, in terms of being that flexible demand resource when needed or to com comply, right? Andrew, I have a really interesting observation that I hope you, you have a comment on and maybe you observe. But, you know, for, for most people, the difference between electricity and the word energy is the same. Okay. And when you read narratives and things, energy and electricity and power is all mixed up, right? Yeah. Mm. Energy for a country like Ireland is electricity, the oil and the, and the petrol that you burn in your car, and the home heating and the gas, etc. okay? And other bits, right? So let's break that down just for one second. The only target set that was met was the electricity target for 2020. We didn't hit any target for re decarbonizing our transport. We didn't hit any targets for decarbonizing our homes. And we didn't hit any target for reducing methane and emissions for agriculture. So we paid 50 million quid for those other three and not a shilling for the electricity. Not a shilling. Yeah. No, okay. I, I agree. I, I'm an electrical engineer, and, and even I right. think the electricity system gets a bit too much. Okay, in this. so it's so, always, so it's always the electric. Our electricity, and I was really smiling earlier, Andrew, when you said about being an electrical engineer. Here's the funny, well, that's funny at all because I got killed on it. In Nor in Denmark, we put the Danish up on this massive pedestal as being the exemplars for renewable wind energy, and they have us on this pedestal. Yeah. They have Ireland, an island with very little interconnect, 36% or 40 whatever percent. It is globally in engineering circles. And Andrew, correct me if I'm wrong. It's up there with how on God's name could those dudes do that? Okay. With a, let's call a neutral bias for policy and a very growing nimbyism, litigious society for interconnects, overground, underground, wind farms, etc. They deliver the only target, in spite, Damien, of all these hogs called data centers. Okay, <laughs> okay. well, okay, maybe, uh, just, uh, thanks for that analysis there, Gary. Maybe you can just take a few questions that are coming in here and ask uh, Andrew and yourself, uh, your response to them. Um, one um, here says, will data centers be asked to pay the infrastructural costs for strengthening the grid? Has the panel any comment on the lobbying power of data centers? Maybe you have something to say about the lobbying power. Do you have a secret uh, sort of channel to the Taoiseach or to the Eamon Ryan or anything on this? What do you have to say about the costs of, you know, of the infrastructure necessary to support you know, industry in general, but particularly in uh, data centers, Gary? Anything, there's, anything well, there's a there's a process by which you pay commensurate with how much you want. Mm -hmm. That's just the process that this e AirGrid and CRU and whoever else they mm -hmm. say it's going to cost five billion to upgrade, and you guys want thirty percent of it. You're going to have to pay a percent, a large percentage of that. Like we're like all of us pay a percentage. We don't pay all of it. Mm -hmm. So basically, there is a, there's a structure there, there's a financial structure there, and a lot of the time, the grid reinforcement stuff, mm -hmm. the high-end grid reinforcement, is directly paid by the large energy users, not just data centers. The largest energy user in the state is Intel. Okay, so you would say that data centers are paying their way for the infrastructure, they're not on a, on a freebie, uh, you know, no, as regards... No. The no, but, the, but, but that's the, you wouldn't expect that. Sure. You wouldn't okay. expect that. I mean, that's that's a, basically the grid has to be paid for. And when we go back to some of the reports that were in circulation over the last couple of years, that nine billion just for data centers, and then you get the grid supplier themselves saying our whole budget is two. Mm -hmm. There's a disconnect somewhere. And okay. I think ultimately then when you get to, um, and I'm sure this will come up in our discussion, but you know, we have a thing where we need to accelerate our ambition to connect more renewable energy that we've available onto the grid, okay? okay. 
There's a process to go through. There's auctions to go through. It's very structured. So how do we leapfrog that? Well, you leapfrog that if you're in a position to be able to do a corporate power purchase agreement. Mm -hmm. And you basically can circumnavigate that whole thing. But what you also do, which is often forgot, you pay the full PSO levy, the, the public service obligation levy okay. to connect the wind. So let's take up a, this an issue there when we're talking about uh, costs and um, burdens on, on the grid and who's, you know, who's paying what. Um, there's some this, this analysis which has shown that data centers in the rather uh, the sudden uh, irony could actually be supporting a more sustainable environment because their spare capacity in their backup could be part of the solution to storage, the storage capacity issue that is associated with renewable energy. When the wind doesn't blow and there's not sufficient energy in the grid, that's when data centers could be contributors to the grid, albeit with generators that may be using fossil fuels, but at least in the interim period, in the transition period between now and when we're fully carbon neutral, we need to have some type of storage capacity so that the grid is sustained. Is, is that a correct analysis, Andrew, that data centers could provide that necessary backup well, capacity? My, my understanding is, is yeah, of course, they have on-site backup generation, Gary knows more than me. Now, if they're diesel gensets you're turning on, that's not particularly clean. Yeah. But if it's, if, it's, if, it's, if it's to provide much needed supply on the system for a short term, on a short-term basis, sure. But I wouldn't see turning on diesel sets as being a particularly desirable Ever. No, no, for nobody, for, for, yeah. for nobody, including the service level agreement for the actual center, because those things are meant to be fired up absolutely when necessary. I mm -hmm. think what you're suggesting and is absolutely true and, and is actually going to be part of a much bigger discussion around what is a smart grid, where you have the concept of both a consumer and a, a, a prosumer, I guess, where mm -hmm. smart grids are where all act uh, most participants are able to assist both taking and giving back, including some of the stuff today, I'm sure, about solar panels on your roof and, you know, selling a bit and all that type of stuff. Data centers, as we evolve and as we get better with technologies, and then we talk, Andrew, about BESS and all these other things, which are short-term uh, storage, they're batteries, large batteries, but they're also, I think, used to normalize frequencies and stuff mm -hmm. like that as well. Yeah. They don't mm -hmm. just store. So what you could have, if you can imagine a data center, its first line of defense is what's called a UPS. It's a big battery, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and that's what they depend on. So we're now starting to look at, well, how could they be integrated maybe into a best type, mm -hmm. or maybe we'll have legislation that will dictate. Mm. And what you're doing there is you're actually reducing capex on the grid because you've got better grid citizens. Mm. And that, and Andrew, you may, you may sort of contradict me here, but sometimes, just sometimes in life, it's okay to be a laggard. Why? Because you can then start to deploy great technologies that everybody else has tried and haven't worked. There's no doubt, despite we got the 43%, right? that we really haven't been overly proactive, right? We've 25 megawatts of offshore wind with a capacity of 50 gigawatts of the stuff, right? Mm -hmm. That coming at it now, whilst it's problematic, it's a bit like when I look at my, my uh, kitchen when my daughter is making cakes, it's a mess. And then she makes these wonderful pavlovas when she cleans it all up. At the moment, it looks like a mess. It looks like there's flour and there's eggs and there's everywhere. It's not the worst time for robust, policy we are going to accelerate what we need to accelerate and then execute mm -hmm. whereas it's been a bit flippy floppy you know okay sure. i can't get a data center connection oh no you can't have a data center connection oh you can't have a wind farm there no you can't have a wind farm there and legislation has been just too unpredictable mm -hmm. and therefore how can anybody plan anything so we okay. arrive at a situation today and I just want to call this out. I actually, I, I didn't get to read much today of the climate action stuff, but I just thought I'd read this out. If you have a second. Sure. Yeah. Data centers, okay? Ensure that the growth of large electricity users can only happen in alignment with our sectorial emission ceilings and renewable energy targets. Okay? Mm. 
that is unequivocally clear that mm. somebody in the planning authority or the local council now will look at the sector, will look at the county, will look at the, I guess, data centres are part of enterprise, mm. whereas at the moment up to now it's been siloed. It's been mm. all siloed in different places. And does the lad down in Clonee really mind about something that's gone on up in South Dublin County Council? But when we read that type of thing, that we're now going to have sectorial targets. If anybody in any industry, any sector, or any individual disagrees with that form of progress, that you have to be accountable, and it has to be part of the national, which then subsequently goes into the Green Deal for Europe, mm -hmm. you're, you're, not, you're not, not connected with reality. Okay, you actually bring up a point there, uh, Gary, which someone's actually just uh, sent in a question uh, here, and it relates to accountability and targets and metrics that we have to reach or, or we won't will be or, or, or we will be in you know violation of our obligations um, in the EU green deal um, it says here is that in an article uh, that um, was or, or in a piece from the biannual report from the host in Ireland it, you stated that to, although the number of data centers is expected to double over the next five years um, it's expected the carbon emissions will remain more or less static at around two two percent uh, and the question really is like Given the importance of data centers to Irish businesses and export industry, is there a national strategy to work with these organizations, that is the data centers, to ensure that their commitments regarding 100% renewables and net zero emissions are realized and their power consumption optimized in Europe? I mean, is there accountability for the data center so that when you're saying these figures, we will only have 2% uh, of, of Ireland's greenhouse uh, emissions associated with our activities as a data center, can that be policed or can that be verified? And not just the data center, but all industry is going to have to be more accountable. How will the data center be held more accountable? Is there an organization which can hold the data center community to account to prove the numbers that they're putting out? I, I think the answer directly is no. Up to today, there's no accountability for pharmaceuticals, data centers, finance, wafer fabs. Mm. You know, there's no. Sure. Yeah. So it's the same deal. <laughs> So what this new target-based sector, sector targets, if I understand correctly, what we're now getting at is that we can emit X amount of stuff between now and 2030. Mm -hmm. It's going to be back-ended, isn't it? To 24, 25, 26, 27, as a nation. Sure. And within that, it's going to be broken out then into the big sectors like agriculture, transport, house, House, you know, oil and houses and industry. And within industry, we're going to have a subsector. And mm -hmm. subsector one will be pharmaceuticals, one will be data centers, one will be uh, wafer fabs, others will be bio. And each one of them will have to come in. What I hope that will do personally is that then we will become accountable here. Mm -hmm. Because there's an often uh, uh, in all industries where we say, oh, yeah, within Europe, we're fine because we're using loads of. Uh, corporate PPAs up in Norway. Mm. So I think this whole new structure, Andrew, and I hope you'd agree, is it gives more transparency to what green means. Because mm. <laughs> some of the electrons that you can well, buy... Well, maybe I could bring Andrew into, the uh, in, yeah. into that point now. I would, Andrew, I'd love to, in, yeah. in terms of I mean, the sector accountability, I mean, it, we are, we, we, as I said at the start, we are now at a bridge, you know, we're at a, a point where we have to consider really the future. We are experiencing mm. a climate crisis. So we're going to have to change our societal norms. We're going to have to change how we do business. And we have to be more accountable for what we do. Is there strategies, is there legislation coming down the tracks that are going to make us more accountable for our actions and, and activities in society in, in general? Um, well, I don't quite know on the, on the corporate side, but I think the point that needs to be made on this in terms of accountability is like the climate action plan, it, as I said earlier, it relies on the citizen buying mm -hmm. a new car that's electric, as I said already, you know, there's there's a range of these decisions and the government are going to provide supports and grants for retrofit and, and so on. But mm -hmm. this requires a great, and, and we're in a capitalist Western society, you know, consumer movement. And that's, mm -hmm. that I think is the, the big risk that, you, you know, maybe you can put in legislation to make, you know, large corporations accountable and maybe we should, fine. But actually the power lies with, with the citizen and whether 
they are they are on board and and you know the question of a just transition comes to mind we've been doing work here in ucd a colleague dr gertie shutema looking at the just transition working with communities in the midlands who face the closure of the peat plants there so the peat power plants are closed due to well the end of life but also due to you know uh, environmental targets uh, and that's been copper fastened again today in the climate action plan but there's communities there that have lost a range of jobs you know th that plant was the the heart of that community for a range of reasons so you know and i think there's the findings of the work down there was that there was a degree of cynicism and perhaps quite rightly to say you know there's talk of a just transition and you come down and not not new cd now but you know the, the government sure. and the state agents come down and talk to them but they just kind of think that's all chat and talk and you know won't lead to anything and again a bit like you know the undermining of confidence in the electricity grid if you're if you undermine the confidence of the communities then you know then we're really going to end up not hitting what we need need to hit it really brings a read doesn't it that when we look at you know the, the data centers expanding i mean they're they're expanding according to the demand that we're generating for them now some of that would be netflix some of that would be you know sending down photos to Facebook, you know, and that is all data that's going down. Does mm. society itself have to hold itself accountable for this demand? I mean, in the 19th century, we we had the economist Jevons, and he was said that as assets become more more productive we tend to use them more or as we become more efficient we use them more so like as coal became cheaper we just used more and more coal when we had the industrial revolution. So at the moment we can use the internet, Google, we can do our searches, we can do all those things, and apparently it costs yeah. us nothing. Do we as a society have to realise that there is a price to pay? I think yeah. there's some figure saying that for all the Google searches in the world, that generates the equivalent of 5 million tonnes of carbon a year. If you add up all these individual searches, the billions of searches that are done a year, if you calculate all the energy those yeah. individual yeah. Um, searches accumulate in one year, it's equivalent to 5 million tonnes of carbon. No, so, can't I, I, I agree. Yeah, no, I agree. I think there's a significant energy carbon. energy footprint to kind of all the services that most of us use, as you say, Netflix, businesses are in the cloud, you know, everything is, is up there and there may be a great kind of macro efficiency to that, but, you know, whoever deletes anything, uh, Squid Game and Netflix, that has caused a massive rocketing of, of, you know, streaming and data and energy usage. So I think we do need to reflect on, on that. Well, the question for Ireland is, we're hosting streaming, not just for our needs, but also globally. And, you know, that might be just absolutely fine. But again, for me, it just comes back to a choice of industrial development, FDI. Let's not just say, oh, it's simple, no more data centers. We need to make that choice as a country in light of, of everything and everything that FDI has brought to this country, let's say. David, oh, Gary, I, I'll let you in. Yeah, can I just put some context again, if I may? Um, sure. So okay. the International Energy Association, which I hope Andrew would agree, is one of the formative number crunchers. Are they? They're pretty well respected and they're out there with the advisors to policymakers and um, stuff. Like that. Yeah, they, they seem to have a latter conversion to renewable energy. So historically, they were maybe more fossil fuel oriented. But yes, they are. Yeah. They are respected. Yeah, on. they're respected. So basically what they've done is they've globally looked at the whole digital footprint right yeah. and they come out with a number which is pretty much now the de facto that between one and a half and two percent of all of the global electricity is going into digitization one and a half to two percent okay and electricity globally is accountable for about 25 percent of carbon emissions in and around that so take your 1.5 to 2 percent of 25 and you get a finite number right Mm -hmm. And it's in and around whatever it is, 0 0.046 of all emissions is relative to digitization. Okay. The irony of it is, really, is that we had computers. You know we had, Damien, because you were working in them. There was inefficient servers all over the world. There was comms room with a half a megawatt in the UCD campus that was only using a smidgen of it. So it's wrong to say... And what they've demonstrated is that in 2010, electricity used by ICT and related services was also one and a half to two percent. But guess what? It was all over the place. It was in your comms room. It was in your wiring closet. It was in big, heavy computers on your desk. Now you've got a little light laptop, right? Mm -hmm. However, what's happened is there's 12 and a half times more data. There's 20 times more traffic. But it's sitting very nicely at 1.5%.
Mm. But there are figures, Gary, that would suggest that with the mobile phones, and now we have the edge, you know, these are the small data centers that we're going to have for our 5G and our internet of things, and so we can monitor our Fitbits and all of the monitoring that we're doing. Now, that's going to increase the traffic by 400% in the next 10 years. 100%. Yeah, so... I mean, so there is med- going to be there is going to be a, an increase in uh, energy demand. You know, no, no, no question, no question. Yeah. And I, su- I suppose I shaped this at the start, and I said, let's look at what that data is doing. Mm. Let's look at let's look at what I just got installed. Don't even know what it is yet, but I got a smart meter in my house. Mm. Great. I guess that's okay. Andrew. I guess that's to help reduce the carbon emissions of the grid by X percent by being more efficient. Um, well, not directly. It'll it'll allow your supplier to offer you more dynamic tariff plans so they can kind of incentivize you with pricing to use less when the demand is high basically That's okay the and it gives them more predictability where they can fire up this and bring down they that, can right? they can disconnect you without calling to your house as well <laughs> <laughs> i'm sure that might be true but they, can, they can do the meter Sorry. reading remotely go on but fundamentally fundamentally Data, the smart stuff in smart cities, smart grids, yeah. smart this, smart the other, smart the other. If it's bringing down 30% of overheads in cities for electricity, okay, where's the checks and balances? Where's the check? You're using more electricity and hopefully it'll be green to generate data that's taken bad stuff out of society. So we have to have a checks and balance, just not to, to Andrew's point earlier, I thought it was brilliant. He said, you can't look at anything in isolation. Sure. If, the, if the centers in Ireland were just big sheds, taking in electrons and nothing going out the other side, you'd say, what a waste of time. Mm. But they're not. So, so just coming to, to that, I mean, I, I just see we, we have a few minutes left. So just to, to put uh, some sort of conclusion to where we are, we, we can see there are lots of benefits with data centers. There are concerns about energy consumption, sustainability, and environmentalists naturally will have those concerns. And there's are valid concerns. I'm not saying they're not valid. They're not no. all uh, sort of extreme views. Mm, there's a basis for that assessment. And so there are two sides. And, and one tend to be quite polarized. How can we bring both sides together? So collectively we can go forward and have a data center industry in Ireland, but one in which both sides can accept is a value to society. And at the same time, it's it's within the constraints of the policy and the directions in which we have to go to have a a carbon neutral society in in the future. How do you see that forum being developed? Because at the moment it's very polarized. How do you think we can actually have more mutual respect and understanding of the different positions that we have at, uh, at the moment uh, between the so the pro and anti data center community well I, I my view is a lot of this is arising in particularly sharp context now because there's these fears about blackouts and then people are saying well it's the data centers fault mm. and so obviously yeah the rising demand is, is part of the issue there but you know as i said right at the start you know, we need to build gas plant, we need to invest in renewables, we need to crack long-term storage solutions. So Gary, you mentioned batteries and you're quite right, they're good for short-term, but they don't have the energy capacity to really supply the grid over a long-term. So those are the steps we need to take now. And if no one was worried, I think, about blackouts or amber alerts, and some of the recent amber alerts, I think, are down to COVID causing delays to maintenance of power plants, and those issues are are real. I'm not sure it will be as, as sharp or acute a debate. The other aspect, I think, is the connection cost. But I think Gary has, has spoken about that earlier in terms of you know the connection costs seem to be proportional to the energy demand usage. So, but this, that that message that you talked about earlier, Gary, on that, I don't think that's well understood or, or well kind of penetrated in in the discussion. Uh, I've often thought that wouldn't it be a wonderful thing if we asked all the data center to do is to paint floppy disks on the outside of their buildings because it would be more tangible to people. That actually that's just the because because it, it's monetized floppy disks that's what it is right it's just on photons but you ask a question and, and andrew is so right the actual blackout scares and stuff were due to maintenance of different strategic peaker plants they call them ones they can turn on and turn off and two of them and interconnects and all this type of stuff there's four pieces of documentation all being published two are published two are to be published which are factual they're factual. 
There's been nothing. All this real rage and polarization and horrible stuff in the press over the last three months about data centers has actually been on the basis of no new data, just date dust. Yeah. So we had last week the EPA numbers, which, as we've discussed, was 2020 numbers. Electricity, the only asset class that hit its numbers. That's fact, if you believe the EPA. We've no reason not to. Today, we have the roadmap for Ireland between now and the first of two carbon budgets. Accountability. Yeah, that's the second thing. Next week, getting down into the data centres, we then see next week, um, AirGrid will be publishing the Shaping Our Electricity Future. Okay? We hope that'll feed in to what we published today. Because if it's disconnected, then it's a joke. I can't believe it won't be. And then finally, before the end of the month, we'll have the results of the consultation process for the last six months by the commissioner of or CRU of what's next for data centers in Ireland, bearing in mind, AirGrid have just published the Shaping Our Electrical Future and bearing in mind that we've just done our targets. So all those pieces of fact and data are now available for us to chart our course. And that's what it has to be. We need to decarbonize society whilst maintaining the economic development. Okay. We, and both of them can be achieved. Okay. But it won't be achieved by being polarized. Okay, thanks for that uh, commentary there, Gary. Can I just give, fire off some quick questions uh, about data centers and maybe just maybe 30 second answers from, from you both. Uh, data centers do not provide employment. They provide hundreds when they're being constructed, but only maybe 50 when they're built. Do you want to answer that, uh, Gary? The easiest way to describe it is when Microsoft and Sandy Ford had two and a half thousand people, the warehouse connected to the two and a half thousand people had 50 people in it. Now that we've separated their 3,000 people in Ireland from the centre, which is the current day warehouse, why is everybody saying they don't recruit anyone? It's interconnected. It's like it's part of the FDI programme. So you must look at Microsoft as a entity in Ireland with their five, six, seven thousand people and their warehouses of 2021, which are data centres. Okay. Quick question here for you, Andrew. Do you see any potential for hydrogen as an energy storage system in place of battery diesel generators? Uh, yeah, absolutely. The, the production of green hydrogen in particular in the coming years will be increasingly re relevant and important. So, you know, I've been talking a lot about electrification and that is absolutely the, the way of the future, but it, it can't. There are sectors of energy demand which electricity won't be able to supply. And, you know, an energy vector such as hydrogen hopefully produced by renewable means through electrolysis can absolutely be part of that. It can, it's another means of energy transport. So there's a big future for green hydrogen. Again, another opportunity for the country. Just very quickly, you mentioned Denmark earlier, Gary, and you're quite right, they're in the middle of Europe, it's easier for them. But what they did was they got on board and reaped the economic benefits of the integration of wind You know, ahead of us, which we didn't do. And I guess I'm saying there's some choices we can make now yeah. That can leave us in a good position. Is, okay, thanks. That there's another quick question here. Um, someone's saying we're missing the value of data centers. What's the value of the Irish economy of a ton of carbon dioxide from electricity generated for a data center versus a ton of carbon dioxide for beef or Ryanair passengers? Um, I'm sure Ryanair or the farmers <laughs> wouldn't necessarily agree with that, uh, but um, is that well, a valid it's point? true? Well, it's, but it's a very valid point. But just going back to sorry, sorry to go back a second. But we also, we also have a really strong drive to replace all diesel gensets with, with um, uh, fuel cells, which is a form of um, uh, hydrogen, smaller, smaller type. The other that we're starting to see as well, which is really encouraging, is biodiesel being used. Right. So These are all industry, another, another opportunity there in, in the economy. The, the, well, they're, they're, at the moment, we're bringing it in from Northern Ireland, I understand, because they have some. But effectively, you know, the small, these are only small. When you consider a gen set is only maybe fired up for two hours every quarter. <laughs> you okay. Know, you okay, just we have a few minutes left. So maybe, gentlemen, I could ask you just a, a question. What do you see as the future, of, uh, Gary, for data centers in Ireland? Where do you see, what's your vision for data centers in Ireland? Where will we be in 10 years' time regarding data centers? I, I genuinely believe with all these documents that are being printed now, that the pathway to 2030, 
um, that it'll become apparent that as we decarbonize the grid and getting back to one of the questions about how do we make sure that the data centers are using a green electricity, green the grid <laughs> and, and connect them. And then it's green. If it's 80%, if that's our target, then we green the grid. Mm. You know, that's how we make sure. Uh, that they're going to be renewable. It's the same reason as it's often, and, and, and I'm sure, Andrew, you find it, people say, I'm, I'm carbon-free driving my, my electric car. Well, you're actually probably 43% <laughs> carbon-free <laughs> because the wire that's coming in your house is 57% okay. carbon. Okay, with that, I'll just sorry to cut across you again, just to get a quick last question for, for uh, uh, Andrew. Um, what, what do we what concerns do we have about the power co the continuity and the integrity of the power supply in the grid now and in the future can we can we generate the capacity there for the demands that are going to be put on it with electrification and data centers etc is it possible and what do no, we do what do we need to do is, to do that yeah no it absolutely is, is possible i mean this winter it's down to as i said there's been two power plants in particular that have been offline due, i think due to covid disruption of their maintenance schedules and that's led to problems um, that should be a temporary issue. One of them's back, the other one's due back, you know, and so as long as we should be okay this winter. Um, the issue in the slightly longer term is, you know, there was a capacity for a new gas plant which didn't yield any interest or any new plants. So we need to build more gas plant as part of the transition, strange as it might sound. And we also need more interconnectors. And that's part so of the So the technology plan as well. is there and the solutions there, but we need to deploy them and use them and invest in them. Uh, that's your message, Andrew. But yeah, as long as we take the right steps and, and prompt steps, I think we should be fine. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks, thanks to you, Gary, and thanks to you, Andrew. And I see Maeve is about to come back in. So I guess the time is about up. We have about two minutes left. So uh, just to wish to thank, uh, I mean, maybe you'll do the same, Maeve, but I just wish to thank Gary and Andrew for a very lively and informative uh, conversation and to thank our guests, uh, alumni and whoever, whoever they may be in Ireland or around the world for their uh, interest in this topic. And I'm sure it's something that will come back to one shape or form over the next uh, years it's not something that is just going to go away right now it's a hot topic and i think it's something that we'll come back to at some time in the future so thank you to everyone you're very welcome thank you thank you indeed uh damien thank you very much um i'd like to reiterate what you said there um a completely interesting conversation with lots of food for thought on a really compelling and very significant issue and i think we'll have a lot of conversation uh, to come on this topic and uh, given the level of interest and the level of questions coming in I think it might be a topic we may have to revisit. Uh, so thank you very much to Andrew, Gary and Damien for joining us this evening and to our audience for tuning in as well and being so engaged with the topic. We'll have a recording of the event tomorrow on our YouTube channel and just before we wrap up, I would like to let you know about the UCD Alumni Awards that will be taking place virtually on Thursday, the 18th of November at 7 p.m. We'll have a link in our chat channel to, uh, where you can register and join us and our host, Pat Kenny, to celebrate our 2021 awardees. So again, I'd uh, like to thoroughly thank our excellent speakers, Gary, Damien and Andrew, and to everybody who joined us here this evening. We look forward to seeing you at our next webinar and good night.